it's a really, it's a really interesting presentation, and <laughs> we we might need uh, more sessions to, uh, to to touch on all those uh, results. Maybe just to kick it off, what Andre, what do you think are the the main opportunities uh, use cases for for merchants for using open banking? Thank you for uh, this question. Thank you, thank you for your invitation. So first of all, I would like to precise uh, uh, an interesting point. is uh, the case that uh, in Europe, open banking has been launched by the regulation, PSD2. Mm -hmm. So there is a purpose of uh, harmonization. But uh, in the fact, we observed a very fragmented approach among the different countries in Europe. So we have already discussed about uh, the most proactive countries like uh, the UK or even the Nordics, but I think that there are also many interesting use cases in other European countries. I will mention one of them, it's Portugal. Uh, in Portugal, open banking has been launched by SIPS, the national payments actor. Uh, SIPS launched its own API in February of 2019, SIPS API market, and it was a trend to open Portuguese financial market to new users and the electronic means of payment. We observed, for instance, interesting uh, partnerships like, uh, for example, a partnership between SIPS and uh, the movie theater group Luso Mundo. And uh, we observed also that uh, open banking in Portugal created a boost in the field of adoption of electronic users, like, for instance, instant payments. According to the last figures of uh, Banco de Portugal, we have a progress of 60% in volume uh, in uh, instant payment in Portugal. So it is a very very interesting trend. Other interesting use case is uh, the topic of Spain. In Spain, uh, banks uh, have been very proactive in the field of open banking with uh, the launch of API very early, like uh, Banco Santander, La Caixa, or even BBVA. And uh, the purpose in, in Spain was to modernize financial services with uh, a strategic partnership with retailers. It is also an interesting point. And uh, last but not least, the case of France. In France, we see a huge interest in the field of open banking, not only in uh, the case of consumers, but also in the case of uh, SME and corporates. And uh, open banking is seen in this country as a huge opportunity to accelerate the equipment in electronic means of payments for corporates and uh, SMEs. So it is also an interesting trend. That's great news. So uh, Portugal, Spain and, and France are, are making uh, steps in, in depth. Uh, any other markets where you see, uh, you know, take up of open banking apart from the ones that are already there, like like the Netherlands? I maybe I'll have a comment on this. I think, um, and we've discussed this by the way right before the panel. Uh, the open banking adoption and uh, in, in general the way it is perceived by businesses and consumers is very much driven these days by if uh, payment rails uh, that were established in the market before open banking was uh, or became a very um, highly used term, um, these countries have uh, a much better way uh, to, to make open banking payments also work in the way that they should be working, right? So I, I would say a great example would be Poland um, and um, Germany as well, because in Poland they have um, they've developed this local clearing system that was that allowed for instant payments right away, no matter how um, you know what kind of bank transfer it was. And uh, in Germany, again, uh, one of the success stories uh, would be Sofort because it was there in the beginning of days, and that allowed for more innovation to come when open banking became a thing. Right. When, when I remember when Ideal started somewhere in the 90s, uh, I was actually the development side, and the way that became successful, well, first of all, it was required because there was no other way to pay, to pay online because in the Netherlands, uh, debit cards can't, can't, use, can't be used online. Uh, the second was that there were free banks basically controlling the market and they were really willing to cooperate with each other. And as you say, France also recognizes a market where there's a lot of cooperation between the banks. Would that be a, a real trigger for our bank to get launched or um, can we leave it to, to market forces? Should it be more like cooperation between between stakeholders primarily? What I do think, you think? Well, yeah. I, it, it hugely helps the kind of implementation and adoption if, if banks can collaborate and look at this as a strategic opportunity. So, you know, where you have 
user experience, which is kind of, you know, I suppose consistent, mm -hmm. you know, um, where there can be um, innovations like variable recurring payments. Um, so, you know, again, the, the UK is kind of doing uh, doing that as we speak and kind of ahead of the pack a little bit. Um, variable recurring payments requires collaboration between the banks or else we're going to have a patchwork of consumer experiences with different liability frameworks, etc. So, yep. you know, if you can get a kind of a, a kind of a collaborated a collaboration um, and an alignment there, then consumers have an easier option to pay right. uh, in many, many more use cases across the industry. So, you know, that these are huge drivers. Uh, and, and look, I, I think genuinely banks who embrace open banking see you know see 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 themselves benefit from it and um, there's loads of potential here for them to get into other products you know into lending into you know um, in a much more buy now pay later model right. um you know c customer experience so you know the banks don't need to lose here you know it's just a question of embracing it yeah I, yeah yeah I, not for does it work Okay. Uh, no, I think the collaboration aspect is important, uh, but not just on building infrastructure, but also in promoting this way of paying. Because, as you say, for, for ideal, uh, something that the banks put out and said, this is a way to pay to their customers and uh, promoted it. In a world uh, with very thin margins, where there is not a lot of money to promote uh, these type of payment methods, you need to have that type of uh, incentivization also coming from, from the banks, um, both from a validation perspective, but also to build trust. Um, because it's easy to associate the name of the, uh, of the bank, but if the bank is the one carrying that message, that would also validate uh, the, the value of this new payment method. Yeah, they actually make a valid point there. Like, Ideal is a very strong brand in the market, and there's some other markets where something similar is uh, existing. Do we need like um, a European open banking brand, or is that not something we wanna we wanna have? I don't think it's achievable. <laughs> like, it, the, <laughs> the European yeah. market is so fragmented mm -hmm. from a payments perspective. Uh, every country has their own payment identity that has evolved over the years. And customers are used to that, and you see, like even SEPA as a as a scheme. Yes, it's pan European, but is that something that customers really care about as a brand? Not really. Like it's it's uh, something that you know that you can pay with, but it's not that you look for the SEPA uh, brand uh, as a scheme. So I think it, it might be challenging um, to to build that type of uh, kind of pan European brand in a way. Yeah, I, I agree. agree. I yeah. agree. It is difficult because, in addition to uh, the national habits and uh, the national culture in the field of payments, we have also other differences. Uh, the vision about uh, innovations, for instance, uh, if you take uh, crypto assets, you don't have the same vision in France and in Portugal or in Switzerland. And the uh, other key aspect is uh, pan European strategy is not in the same level according to the country. For instance, in France, Europe uh, sovereignty uh, is uh, uh, one of the key points of uh, the strategic plan of the French Comité National des Paiements Scripturaux, whereas in Portugal, uh, payments actors like, for instance, SIBS are uh, working and thinking about uh, uh, opportunities in Latin America or African countries, so uh, you don't have the same uh, level of, uh, of debate about uh, pan-European strategies in, uh, in other European countries. Okay, so it's gonna even uh, going to other markets than uh, than Europe from from there because the the Spanish banks would maybe take it to Latin America and uh, French banks would take it to some of the African countries. So that's potential to yeah, roll out further. Yeah. Yeah. Are any any critical barriers that that you, that we see here uh, for for open bank? What has to be done to get it to the next level of maturity, uh, Brian? So in, in in the eurozone, the biggest barrier is uh, ASPSPs or banks charging consumers for SEPA instant. Um, you know, so we don't have kind of SEPA instant across the board yet, and that's going to be you know mandated pretty soon uh, from the uh, European Union. So we'll have it you know, in in uh, a short order. But you know that that is needed because it's key to the value proposition, yeah. and then also consumers being charged, particularly for example in in France and other places. It's not unusual for a consumer to be charged one euro for a transaction, which is not going to work. Um, you know, so that's that. That would is the is the biggest uh, point in those countries which happen where it happens. Right. So 
yeah, that's expected regulation for uh, to get instant the instant payment scheme to 100% reachability at least, right? That's going to be expected by sometime end of next year or end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, I, of course, we don't know here what's coming on, but that might be that also the, the price will be some way regulated. So that's okay. An instant payment may not be more expensive than a credit transfer. So that means in practice that the price will go to zero and that, that will really help, uh, well, instant payments, but also, of course, the open banking proposition sitting behind it. I see, well, I don't, <laughs> I can't read it from here. Also, lots of questions from the audience. So maybe we can pick one on those as well. So can, how can open banking uh, compete with payment methods which are already massively adopted, such as Ideal or Blick, right? So, so is that a, a big barrier as well? That okay, you know, Ideal is, well, it, as a concept, it's open banking, but not open banking as we use it here. Um, is, is it difficult to, to launch uh, these products in, in these markets? And, uh, you, you may know this, right? Because you <laughs> yeah. probably tried to get Klarna into the Dutch market, but yeah, yeah there's some challenges there. Yeah. I think, you know, if we would um, partner up with somebody in Netherlands in a, with a very, very um, popular merchants or something like this from Netherlands, and they would have the ambition to launch their own bank-based payment option, this would this could absolutely have. Um, um, they would have a chance definitely to compete with Ideal, right? Because uh, if this is, let, let's imagine um, if this is a cool brand, let's say Booking.com, right? Let's, mm -hmm. uh, if they would launch um, their own bank-based payment option, what this would do, this would decrease their payment costs with other providers because they would have it in-house. Second of all, Booking.com is a very well-known brand. So again, this is something they could um, definitely Try, try and do. Um, and um, yeah, I think this is uh, definitely a way to go for uh, for some brands. If you have a, str a strong brand in the market, in your home market, and you would like to push it even further, um, again, jumping on this embedded finance trend, right, to really mm -hmm. embed financial services into your offerings as well. Right. Um, this, I, I definitely believe in that. Uh, the the issue with doing it, uh, and we've talked a bit about these uh, barriers, um, is 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 maybe the time and the and the effort it would take the merchant, uh, because there are a lot more other priorities at the moment. Uh, we are in the in the beginning of recession. I think there are things that we have to optim or merchants have to optimize uh, before they look um, towards this route. Yeah, I, I would not probably go uh, and try to build an open banking solution in a market where there is already a very established uh, user experience that is very similar. Because in the end, what problem are you solving from a customer perspective? Mm, probably none. Uh, if you're just trying to reduce your, your margins, ideal and other similar options probably are already very uh, cost effective compared to other payment methods. So the direct cost savings are limited and then as you're saying there is the opportunity cost of choosing that project over something else and the list of priorities is this big so Absolutely. it's going to be very at the bottom of the list yeah, i think it's may hurt uh, in brian's presentation but also in the, in the former session on open banking that actually merchants say uh, conversion is more important than cost right <laughs> so mm -hmm. improving the, the the top line revenue is getting getting priority do you recognize that so basically you you know how how many payment methods you want to support for in your business just to make the customer easy as easy as possible to pay or, or is it a more balanced game it's, it's a mix like if you don't you look at everything like you look at your pnl you look at the profits that you bring home and you maximize profit and fees are part of the of the equation uh, as increasing the top line but you want to find the right payment mix. You want to optimize the PL. Uh, you want you might want to reduce uh, processing fees on one side, but you might want to increase them somewhere else because that payment method brings you incrementality, brings you more users, brings you uh, additional uh, customers that would have otherwise have dropped. So it, it's a bit naive in a way to look at just conversion rate or just cost, and you you need to take the different pieces and put them together. Yeah. It will probably also depend on the, the type of business, right? That uh, that you're running, that so you can have maybe live live with only cards, or that you have to support the full suite of uh, payment products. Like, like one merchant I recently spoke with said, we just want to support any payment method because it's more important that people buy stuff than um, 
then we pay an extra penny for for a transaction. But yeah, that's depends how the strategy works. So, is another question here is open banking payments are going to replace cards, uh, or to what extent maybe will open banking payments replace cards? It is one of the questions of the French payments ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. Open banking, uh, instant payment, new means of, of payment versus cards. Uh, I will say that uh, many merchants in France aim at uh, finding uh, alternatives to cards because of uh, business model. As you know, uh, uh, cards are very costly for merchants. But uh, when we analyze the history of payments, we see that it is very difficult to replace a mean of payment by another. We saw that with the checks in France. Some companies yep. uh, use checks. Uh, whereas we have other means of payments like instant payment, SDD. So uh, I think that it will be difficult to replace uh, cards by uh, open banking solutions. Yeah, it would definitely not replace because we still use uh, 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 cash, right? It was invented like 600 years before Christ. So <laughs> <laughs> payments is always adding things on top. But and as you see, the whole market is growing. So uh, the whole boat, every boat is lifting. At a certain point, you say, okay, is um, is let's say payment payment means are going to shift from cards to open banking, and what does it mean for the business models of the of the retail banks that live partly on interchange? Is that do you see resistance from 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 those banks that are pushing back against open banking because they want to keep their current revenue models, or is that is that not an not an, uh, an important argument? In the beginning, uh, it was a, a form of reluctancy by uh, French banks about open banking because of uh, this uh, situation, but also uh, security concerns because, as you know, uh, France has a strong tradition of security and confidence in the field of payments. And uh, there were also a question of competition. Uh, but today, I think that uh, French payments market is more mature in the field of open banking and uh, is looking on the opportunities of uh, open banking. I think we should take a look at where banks earn money, actually, because open banking for banks is not bringing them any revenues. Now, cards on the other side are bringing them a bunch of interchange, especially if those are credit cards where in Europe it's 0.3%, if I'm not mistaken. And if you offer corporate cards, the interchange is not really regulated, so you can get as much as 1.5% from a transaction value. So I kind of understand why banks are not very big fans of open banking, uh, because regulation came and they, they sat down and said, OK, look, we now have to develop those PSD2 APIs. I don't know, they said so, and they started developing them, right? Um, and I think they're definitely threatened right now because um, one, one of their revenue sources from, um, from inter card interchange is uh, slowly decreasing. So I think that's, that's a fair point from banks uh, to be a little bit uh, yeah, upset about losing these revenues. But yeah, it's about the customer these days. And then you talk about... Uh Europe, where the interchange fees are kept at, let's say, 30 or 20 basis points. Exactly. Um, if you look at the United States, where interchange can be easily like 2%, right? Yeah. It's very, very difficult to introduce uh, instruments that uh, take a uh, bite of, the, of that revenue. So, okay, that, that may potentially be uh, a barrier for, for upper banking. And, and look, I think it's, it's yeah. been, it, yeah. it was a bigger concern in the, in the early days of open banking. I think banks were resisting uh, very much to your point. Um, you know, but what we're now starting to see is some banks thinking about how they can release commercial APIs or premium APIs. So, you know, even just a, a few weeks ago, I was with one of the uh, top four UK banks and they are publishing APIs now for uh, age verification and address verification, which will yeah. be premium APIs. So we will pay for their use. Right. But if, you know, if a consumer wants to grant that access um, and it's to the benefit of the merchant, Everyone's happy, so you know. So the, 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 we're starting to kind of explore these things, um, you know, just now, um, and I think there's loads of potential there for uh, for banks to monetize some of this. Yeah, in, in, the, in the former panel, and uh, uh, one of the merchants said that, uh, you know, they want to see the the end game. So are we investing in something that is a uh, little bit more like structured, and they know what's coming out in two, three years? Or is it still very much experimenting, and then we want to stand maybe a little bit more on the sideline? So, what are ways to to get merchants uh, to get more active in open banking and and uh, you know 
offering that to their customers and taking a little bit more risk. How can we test drive? Um, that you mean on the on the area. customer side? On on yeah, on the merchant side. So. Uh, Gen you, you said you did a pilot, right, in, in the open banking one day? So we, we, we did some small tests just to yeah. see what the unprompted adoption could look like in an e-commerce checkout, and that was very low. Uh, okay. So you definitely need to do some level of uh, incentivization, either paid to tell the customer, I'm going to give you five bucks for first transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's from user research. Like We saw that that's something that customers would be keen on trying. Uh, if you present uh, open banking without that type of incentive, they're like, why would I need another payment method? So we're still at that phase where, uh, at least for an e-commerce um, point of view, customers don't really see the need. So it's not a, a customer-driven type of payment method. It's something that merchants would adopt because they see the potentials of uh, uh, cost savings and potentially because of the the problems that 3DS is bringing to, to the industry. Right. So those are the two main angles. But go explain to a customer upfront how open banking works and that it's secure, that it's fully authenticated, that they're giving their login information to an API-based uh, uh, set of logins and not to the merchant. There is a whole set of uh, uh, explanations that need to be given to the customer. So that needs to come uh, from the merchants, from the uh, banks that level of uh, uh, education to, to the users. Right. How do you do that, uh, Daria? The, the, how do you kind of work with merchants to, to get them over the hurdle? We, we have a couple of POCs running at the moment, and what is great to um, to see, or also to understand, right? What we do, um, we have white label solutions for merchants that are so confident in their brand that um, they're like, you know what? We're gonna launch our own, I don't know, IKEA Pay or something like this. That just came out of my mind. That's not a so. <laughs> not the product. Um, yeah, for example, right? Yeah. And uh, they can absolutely do that if they have belief that the brand is uh, has enough trust from the consumers. They can do. It. Now, brands that are not very confident that it's going to adopt, uh, the adoption is going to increase. What they can do, they can implement open banking by Klarna. There is a Klarna logo, and despite um, the solution and what it does, Klarna is still a very, very strong brand. Everybody knows it, con especially consumers on the e-commerce side. Um, and they can use the branded version as well, and then uh, kind of capitalize on on Klarna's brand in that sense. This um, there are. Two, two versions like that we that we have running in the POC um, at the moment, and the third use case um, it was also mentioned on the slide. Uh, brick and mortar would be one of the ways to also test drive this. Um, I want to give you one example of uh, it's not really a merchant thing, but the other day somebody knocked on my door. I live in Munich, um, four hours away from here uh, by train. Um, and the other day somebody knocked on my door, and that was a charity company. They had their little iPad there and said, hey, would you like to donate? I'm like, amazing. I didn't do that in a while. That is very convenient. So what they asked me to do is to put my name in there, and then there was a button uh, that says online bank transfer, right? So there was the direct, uh, there was direct debit, and then there was online bank transfer. He gave me an iPad, I logged in into my bank account, and the transfer was made right away on their iPad while uh, he was, uh, the guy was on the doorstep. This would be also one of the brick mortar use cases, right? This is how you bring e-commerce um, into brick and mortar. And open banking can also be, um, yeah, uh, can help uh, in, in these use cases. So yeah, definitely see that right now. Like what, what, you know, one, one thing we, we, we always kind of find is that as a country gets some of these kind of what we call halo merchants. So, you know, people are always talking about contactless cards getting enabled in London by the TFL, you know, tube um, adoption. The same thing happens in lots of other parts of payments. So once people are used to it through a brand that they trust, you know, like you mentioned booking.com, you know, the next time they see this option, so to pay by bank, and they, they, they can quite easily choose it. The, the other thing that seems to work very well is in countries where a small number of banks have a dominant market share. So it's not unusual for three or four banks to be, you know, 80, 90%. Yeah. 
even in the Netherlands, you'll often see merchants put small little bank logos underneath the idea logo. Um, and that, that's a very effective method as well, where people kind of see, okay, I bank with you know, Deutsche Bank or Sockgen or you know, uh, Barclays, and, and then they get into a flow um, where they have that trust for the bank. So you know, these are also methods that seem to drive, um, drive adoption. Yeah, yep. definitely. Having uh, some kind of catalyst from a merchant perspective is, is going to be key. And I think that's where key players in the industry will have to work with merchants and basically get them as partners in, in, in the endeavor and say, we give you the product for free. Uh, you partner up and you need that type of booster in the ecosystem. And that is an investment from the uh, merchant side and from the provider side. But someone has to get started there. Because otherwise, also from a merchant perspective, the cost benefits, yes, are, are there, but might not be fully there. Uh, like it takes five, six, seven transactions maybe to recover the, uh, the investment that you might have, uh, yep. even with the, um, with the cheap payment method. Yeah, so lots of hurdles still for adoption. On the other hand, if you get it just right, the right circumstances with the right business model behind it and the, and the like trust, it can go very quickly, right? It's an ideal that go to proper market share very quickly. Uh, a Blick has been very successful in Poland. It just just launched a couple of years ago, and it's, it's now very popular. Um, and some there are lots of other examples where you just get it right. Um, I don't think we have seen that yet in, in open banking, but um, I think sometimes we'll we'll hit the we'll hit the uh, the right spot. And I think yeah. convenience is key. So not not that many banks have implemented a great experience. Yeah. You know, so in the countries where the experience is really good on mobile, you know, and you're clicking biometrically authenticated, you're confirming, and that's it. There's no data entry. There's no treaty secure. Yeah. You Absolutely. know, all of these kind of friction points disappear. Yeah. We you know we see really good kind of behavior once somebody tries it and they understand. Now of course the the challenge is to get them to do it for the first time, um, which is where these other ingredients have to come in. And yeah. I think the examples that you brought up are also. Uh, private driven kind of companies uh, so you you have that incentive and less of that fragmentation so there is some agreement that's like okay I'm going to push forward half my mission I have some marketing budget versus having something that is less that's branded across multiple different banks uh, where customers still need to figure out and the experience might be different between different merchants so that might be playing against uh, the adoption. That there is what you were saying, like for some merchants, an unbranded version of open banking might make sense. For others, something more branded can can add value, even if you are solving the same customer problem. Uh, yeah. But in the end, trust is the main thing that you have to solve in the payment space. Yeah, it's not always that easy to really analyze what, what the success factors are because when uh, our deal started, also there was zero pay in Germany, but that not, never really took off. So the, some of the circumstances were, were different. Um, so we will see um, how this uh, will play out. Unfortunately, we are at time. I would love, love to actually spend another hour with you guys. But uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, audience, for listening to us and uh, uh, sending lots of questions. We haven't been able to cover them all, but uh, I'm available, and I'm sure the, the panelists as well, if you want to, uh, to dive into one of those uh, over the coffee. And thank you for the panel. Uh, great discussion. And uh, 